some questions um, in the chat. I've got several of my own. Um, so I'm going to start off with uh, CJ asked, we want to turn the question around. You gave them to you. And that whole, the whole you know, landscape that you just laid out there, when do you think the Civil War became inevitable? Um, I think it's the Mexican-American or the US war with Mexico, because I think that it would have been very difficult to restore the sectional balance, even if some of Southern antics had worked. And so I think it's the acquisition of that free Mexican territory that, that really um, sets things in motion and makes it very hard to avoid um, the, coming, the coming of the Civil War. Yeah, okay, very good. Um, I wonder if you could talk about Manifest Destiny. I know that when I have, when I teach the survey classes, it's like the one day of high school everybody was at and remembers really well. And it gets started out in public history forums pretty regularly. Um, so I wondered if you could just sort of talk a little bit about it as a concept and what you, how you think it does or doesn't or whatever fits into this whole story. Mm. That's, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about because another historian, Drew Eisenberg, is working on showing that manifest destiny was not actually something that Americans were particularly consumed by. And I think that that research is going to, um, hopefully change that that unit or that class that everyone goes to in high school and hmm. i always say that manifest destiny was how they explained it after they did it but nobody's yes. going west because well america needs to be in arizona so we might yes. as well be the first people there Right. Yes, exactly. um, as a way of explaining what has happened as opposed to necessarily a motivation for action. Yes. Does that sound yes. fair? Couldn't have put it better myself. Yeah. Um, so speaking of territories, uh, we had a question about if you can talk about um, Stephen Douglas, Steve is what mm -hmm. I call him, um, why he was so interested in having Kansas, Nebraska organize this territory. We often hear about railroad connections he had out of Chicago and things like that. So um, we had some folks who wanted to know if you could talk about that. Yeah, so Stephen Douglas, as um, the chat has indicated, had owned land west of Chicago that he or historians say he was going to make a lot of money on if there could be a railroad built through that territory. And that railroad could not be built if the Kansas Nebraska territories weren't organized. And so his feeling, you know, the, the historical narrative is often that he was this, you know, base politician who agreed to revoke the Missouri Compromise in order to serve his political interests. There are other historians who argue that Stephen Douglas really believed that the Compromise of 1850, which opened the door to popular sovereignty in the former Mexican territories, that that superseded the compromise of 1820 and would take precedent over that compromise. Uh, I am not an, an expert in Stephen Douglas's political philosophy, but those are, those are the two, um, you know, the crass and the intellectual explanations for why Stephen Douglas uh, agreed to um, propose this act. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Um, it's always interesting getting in the heads of these people, right? Who mm -hmm. sometimes kept diaries like Polk, like your diary, here's what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but most of them didn't do that. So getting into the mind of, of Stephen Douglas, unless he wrote it to his best friend somewhere in a letter, is just so hard to recover. And it's hard to explain, I think, to students sometimes. Yeah. It's like, well, we, we don't know all of it so far. Maybe someone will find a secret diary that's in a trunk in someone's attic, but mm -hmm. it's, it's what we wish we could know. Yeah. Um, so Timothy had a, a question that all of us get, mm -hmm. and I think from, you know, the first history being taught in social studies classes up and through, you know, uh, my graduate seminars. So how do we explain that, you know, not most white Southerners don't own slaves, right? The percentage, you know, of families goes from about a third in 1830 to about a quarter of 1860 because they become more expensive as cotton production mm -hmm. goes up and all that. Um, so, but how do we explain that maybe two thirds of white Southerners are throwing themselves behind an effort 
that they're not as at least directly obviously invested in owning slaves themselves? How, how do we approach that? So two answers to that. The first is that even though only or a minority of Southern whites owned slaves, that they were nonetheless implicated or that they benefited from the racialized system of slavery, that no matter how poor they were, they at least weren't, they, they weren't enslaved. And that that committed them to the project of slaveholders, even though they them they themselves did not own human beings as property. So that's one reason. The other reason, which I also think is quite important, is that the secession conventions that were called in these southern states were primarily attend or the, the people who went to them were primarily elite slaveholders. And these secession conventions decided to secede with varying degrees of undemocratic uh, ma machinations. It's not like every secession convention or every secession decision was submitted to complete ratification by all of the voters. In fact, many of the ratification or the secession conventions who actually did ask the voters, what do you think? They, there was much less voter participation than there was even in the, the election of 1860. And so a lot of the decisions that were being made about secession were being made at the elite level. And that's obviously gonna be a problem during for the Confederacy during the Civil War um, for many reasons that I'm sure you'll hear about next week where it's going to undermine the legitimacy of the Confederate government because it didn't actually have complete buy-in from all of its citizens. And in fact, like a, a large swath of them who were you know, poor and white and didn't see the purpose of, of fighting a war for slavery. Yeah, and and I was, yeah, and to build on that, I would say too, like there, there's what happens when secession happens and then there's what happens after the war begins. And so, you know, for, for those of us who remember 9-11, like things can turn on a dime when you feel like there's you're being attacked. And so um, you have a lot of, in Texas, you have a lot of people who vote against secession that once a war has begun and there's gonna be an you know, invasion of Virginia and wherever else by Lincoln, suddenly say, well, I've got to protect my family. Like they may not see it as a, as a war necessarily in this situation for them to preserve slavery, but a war where they have to defend their family in a certain circumstance. Yeah, um, and I, I just to add on to that too, that there were many people who thought that the Union would let the Confederacy secede without a fight, or that if there was a fight, that they would they would whip those Yankees really quickly, and that it wouldn't it would be it would be like what they thought the Mexican American War was going to be, just a, a funnel jaunt. Obviously, it didn't turn out to be that way. Oh, and the person who called that was Sam Houston. <laughs> he said, you're going to lose and you're going to lose everything and don't be stupid. And they kicked him out of uh, the governorship while they were seceding. And, you know, he dies in 1860 in Huntsville. Um, they didn't live long enough to see he was correct, but I think he didn't want to see himself be correct. Um, so another question uh, from Brady, who was asking about Don Brown's raid as a factor in all of this, which I know when I, I talk about it, I, I always bring in John Brown's raid, but he wants to know, like, proportionally speaking, like, how important is that? Is that a, a something we should be emphasizing when we talk about the, the circumstances that lead to the election of 1860? Yeah, John Brown's raid is incredibly concerning to Southern whites because it is it raises the specter of what they fear most which is a slave revolt in the southern states john brown's aim was to start a slave revolt in the southern states but perhaps what was even most concerning to southern whites about john brown's raid was northern reactions to that raid that while some northerners uh condemned john brown for what he did for his uh use of violence that other Northerners made him into a, a martyr, that they celebrated him. They, they rang their church bells on the day that he was executed. And that showed to Southern whites, again, that they were not they, they were not going to be equal partners within the Union, that the Northern states were not uh, going to defend their interests to the degree that Southern whites believed they needed to. And that that really did help to um, uh, it added to the sense of mm, 
the, the, the union was not serving their interests and that these were not these were not people they wanted to be part of a country with anymore. Yeah. Very good. All right. So um, we got one more question from a teacher and then I have a question I want to end with. Um, so Taylor wanted to know about like when we talk about slavery expanding west and everybody knew even if they're not in that territory, Arizona and New Mexico are very different than Alabama and Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So how much did that debate really enter into the discussions about expansion of these Western territories? It's like, well, you're not gonna grow cotton there or tobacco or wheat, you know? So what, what, are, you, what are you gonna do out there? And how much did that factor into the discussions and the debates? So it was part of the discussion in that people were saying, even in you know, 1846, 1847, we don't need to pass the Wilma Proviso because slavery cannot exist in these arid wastelands. And David Wilmot responds to that argument by saying it can exist. And in fact, it would exist at least legally. Uh, New Mexico passes a slave code very fleetingly in 1849, it's, uh, or 1849, 1859, it's, it's uh, rejected a year or it's voted down a year, year later. But there is this, well, we often think about slavery as plantation agriculture and that it, it is, that's, that's where it is most, um, where we see it most heavily used. But slavery existed outside of plantations. At the time of the American Revolution, slavery existed in all 13 colonies. It existed in shipyards. It existed in farms in northern states. That slavery can exist outside of plantation economies. And so I think Southerners, Southern whites recognized and Northern whites feared that even though New Mexico and Arizona were unlikely to become plantation societies, that they could nonetheless have and have economies that were committed to slavery in ways that would support the um, Southern political bloc. Yeah. And you could look to Mexico mm -hmm. and slavery in the mines and mm -hmm. the examples of which Texas slaveholders like to like claim that the way peons were treated and Indians were treated in Mexico was the same as slavery and just as actually it's worse because you don't have to, in any way, shape, or form, take care of them because there's a bazillion and you don't have any rules the way we do. Um, like they often made that comparison and in so doing point out that it's incredibly adaptable. I mean, slavery is as old as humanity, unfortunately. And um, the, its adaptability over human history is incredible. And it's something Southerners were very well aware of. It's sort of this broad history. They kept looking for reasons to justify their society by looking to the Romans and the Greeks and these different forms of, of societies that included slavery and many permutations um, beyond, beyond what their own experiences are. This is my last question, and it builds on something Melissa just put in here uh, about runaway slaves. So you've written an entire book about slaves running to Mexico and its political repercussions for the continent. So I wanna know if you could sort of talk about that just a little bit in terms of, of its size and significance. And the question I always get, um, so this is a loaded question, the question I always get from students and teachers is, you know, was there an underground railroad to Mexico? Um, and and, and kind of what did that look like coming south from Texas or any other part of, of the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great, it's a great question. I get that question all the time too. Was there an underground railroad to Mexico? I don't think so, at least not to the extent that we mythologize the underground railroad to the northern states in Canada. There weren't there weren't people hanging quilts and putting candles in their windows. I'm not sure there was really much of that in the Northern states either. Um, part of the reason for that is obviously that Texas is a slave state, whereas the Underground Railroad is going through Northern states where you have sympathetic people. There were some sympathetic Germans who some people say was, were helping ferry enslaved people to Mexico, but I haven't found that much convincing evidence to suggest that that's the case. Um, so it's not as organized. Nonetheless, historians have estimated that less than one half of 1% of the enslaved population of the South escaped to the North. And nonetheless, that was one of the huge concerns of Southern whites when they decided to secede. 
that even that amount of threat to the peculiar institution was enough to really strike fear in the hearts of slaveholders. And I think really the same thing was going on among Texas slaveholders. And what's important about that point, I think, is that it's really showing that even though we talk about these high political debates in the floors of Congress, that a lot of these fears that are being stoked in the slaveholding states that they are being stoked by enslaved people themselves, not just the high pollutant white politicians, that the escape of these enslaved people, which came at tremendous risk, had an, a tremendous effect as well on the political decisions of the slaveholding states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're scaring them to death. Yeah. And they're terrified of what the broader implications would be. Yeah. Making them feel vulnerable in a, in, a really, in a way that few of the things really did. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for all that. That's wonderful. Um, I want to pivot to the document session.